Welcome to Construct Tech TV. Today we are going to travel around the country and look at five innovative construction projects. Our hope is this will give you some ideas for your own projects. Today we will be looking at Habitat's Home Builder Blitz, a historic renovation on the Space Needle, Net Zero Energy Apartments, Dayton's Children Patient Tower, and a solar parking canopy. Fast-paced is often the objective of many construction projects. One initiative aims for super fast, as in just one week. Habitat for Humanity's annual Home Builder Blitz first started back in 2002. That year, 12 homes were completed in just five days. This year, that number rises to 200. In June, more than 200 families partnered across 28 states to build or repair homes. To pull together something like this requires careful planning and even coordination. Let's look at the project timeline that begins well before that five days in June. In August, the previous year, participants and sites are identified. Leader groups are also selected. Work with municipal inspectors begin in September. In December, house plans are finalized and material takeoffs are made available to builders. Builder lot assignments are also selected. In February, subcontractors and suppliers are finalized. Come March, project logistics are determined and by April, Subpermits are secured. Finally, in May, foundation and pre-build work is complete. There is a lot of planning involved to make the blitz happen. Still, 200 homes in five days is quite an impressive feat. Next up, the iconic Space Needle, originally built to define the Seattle skyline in 1962 for the World's Fair, this fall, it's getting a facelift while keeping its historical profile. This includes floor to ceiling glass on the interior and exterior, a rotating glass floor restaurant revealing downward views of the structure. Here is where the renovation really shines. The project's team's rehab will allow the Space Needle to remain partially open during the restoration. Instead of closing and scaffolding the entire structure, the team will perform work from elevated work platforms just below the restaurant level. This project will wrap up in June of 2018. Subsequent phases will include upgrading elevators and repainting the structure. 55 years later, the Space Needle continues to be the symbol of innovation and even technology that stands for the city. Until late last year, LA did not allow solar power for apartment renters. 54% of LA is renter occupied. That means millions of people couldn't take advantage of solar. A 263 unit luxury apartment complex is changing all that. Hanover Olympic is a net zero energy complex. Solar produces enough energy consumed in each apartment. Some of the unique sustainable features include LED lighting, smart thermostats, iPad displays for tracking energy consumption. Get ready, LA renters. Solar is coming to one of the sunniest cities in the nation. Hospitals often demonstrate the future of design and technology. This is the case with the Dayton Children's Hospital. The new eight-story patient tower has both innovative tech and design. The Things That Fly design theme is evident in the Take Flight Gallery in the three-story atrium. The structure also includes a culinary kitchen, an up cafe for snacks, the Altitude gift shop, and a rooftop play space. The hospital hired local firms to perform the work. It hired Dayton-based Danis Construction and Champlin Architecture to work with FKP. 
But perhaps most important, the technology is incorporated into the tower to create optimal healing for patients. Now that's what you might call a healthy building. Is your parking smart and efficient? For those living in the River House condominiums near Charlottesville, Virginia, the answer is yes. Stony Point Design Build has installed a solar parking canopy and it will offset up to 100% of the common area electricity usage for the building. Sun Tribe Solar helped bring this to life. The system has 100 solar modules and it will produce an estimated 35,000 kilowatt hours per year. Stony Point Design Build collaborated with a number of partners on this project. It required creativity, collaboration, and certainly persistence. The result is a new way to save the real estate development company a little bit of energy and a little bit of money. And that's your tech update for today. On Safety Zone, we talk a lot about keeping our workers and equipment safe on the job. But we talk a lot about, or we don't talk a lot about, I should say, the environment itself. The very nature of construction surely alters the look of the environment. In an effort to protect Mother Earth, there are companies making a pact to ensure that what is left behind protects our environment. Here to tell us all about it is Eric Olson, Safety Director for Western Specialty Contractors. Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Eric, let's talk about what you guys have done to really talk about some safety policies that you guys are all kind of instilling into the construction marketplace. Well, the first thing that we really do to invite in include safety with everything is from the very beginning when we estimate our projects we ensure that we cover costs and, and things like that that might jump up and then we always make sure we have a solid work plan that goes into the project from beginning mobilization all the way through to the end of the demob we plan every step we have a plan we communicate it with our workforce and make sure they have the tools and the knowledge they need to be successful how does that differ than what you guys do for let's say some of the competition out there well, I think from a lot of the point that we deal with as a company is that we're a lot larger than most of our competitors, and so it's a, a lot easier for us to probably spend time and resources developing safety. Uh, I have a staff of several that work for me, and we travel around and we visit the job sites on a very regular basis, and we're dedicated to safety specifically. Uh, some of our competitors aren't as large as us, and they can't afford or don't have the same resources that Western has, so we can put the time and effort into it to have a good, solid safety program. Now, you guys have had a very impressive record history, you know, for safety. I think if I looked at it, it was something like 100 years. You guys have been really focusing on this. But when you look at all the things you've been doing, safety is paramount that we always say on the job site, but we still have way too many injuries, I think, of that. But now you guys look at the environment, too, as being one that have to work kind of in tandem. So how do you guys look at that, making sure the contractors out there are safe, but also how that plays in together with the environment when we think about it? Well, for us, a lot of the environmental impacts that we have are, are kind of contained to the job site. We're not a big GC that's sprawled over large areas, so it's a little bit easier for us from that standpoint, but we certainly make a lot of effort to uh, instill, uh, can collect water runoff, uh, deviate it, collect it, um, we choose products and materials that are environmentally sound. A lot of the times that we're, uh, the products we're using are VOC limited or VOC not, or compliant, so there's not a big impact from the material we're using. So we try to communicate that with our ownership so where there is a, some flexibility on the product to be installed, they ask us for our advice and we say, well, we have some products here. These are very good. This is a great product and it's also environmentally sound. So we do sometimes... Uh, have some input there as to what in materials we're actually using. And we try to use VOC uh, low emission type products. So you're really talking about in order to do that, you really have to look at technology. Technology has to play a critical role in that. You can't just say, well, we know this is sound, but VOC sound. You're, you're really saying technology has to play 
key part in all of that. Absolutely. One of the big things that we like to do as a company is we always have a good relationship with our material suppliers. And I'm not talking about the local supplier, I'm talking about the actual manufacturer of the uh, material. So we have communications with them, our, our, our executive management we meets with them and we get to know the product suppliers and reps and, and it helps us to really understand the product we're installing and we become experts in that material. Not just how to Im actually install it, but we understand its components. For those watching right now, they, they're probably thinking, is there a downside to being so environmentally conscious? Because I know people, we're all thinking about wanting to have this green footprint, but I think at the same side of that, there's got to be that other side that you go, you know, everybody has mixed emotions about it. Is, what's your thoughts on that? You know, from my standpoint, I'm not, you know, this huge environmental person, but I do respect the planet. I, I have a degree in biology, and it's one of the things that I hold dear to my heart. So for me, I feel that it doesn't take a huge change in work type or mentality to have an environmentally friendly impact. Uh, I think just using the correct products, instilling the, the collection, water runoff, things of that nature, collecting your material, and, and just doing little things can go a long way, and most of that comes from planning the job up front and knowing what you're going to get into. So let's, I, I guess the question that comes to mind, is, are there key steps that you can have or encourage companies who might be watching to say, here's some really simple steps to develop a safety program. You know, if you don't have to be this environmental green, you know, crazy kind of company, but there's some basic steps you can get involved right now to make your company, you know, safe about, you know, having good safety programs, be environmentally conscious. Here's some things you can do right off the bat. The easiest thing I would recommend is for the executive management to really understand and buy into the program. Um, you can have a safety person that sit there on the job site and preaches safety all day long, but if management's not on so board... So you're saying top-down first, um, start there. Absolutely. Top-down, 100%. Ownership down. If they believe in it, buy into it, it will succeed. And at Western, the Bishop family, my bosses, they have all been very successful. They, del they believe 100% in safety. Our biggest resource really is our people. We can buy new tools and new equipment. You can't buy new workers. So if you do the things that are going right, treat your folks the right way, have the right safety policies, you will have a great safety program. Well, I'll tell you, Eric, it was great having you on the show today. So thank you for joining you. us for Air Safety Zone. We appreciate it. And that's it for Safety Zone for today. Safety, we talk about it all the time, but we don't always talk about some of the screw-ups. Perhaps it's time we learn from our mistakes. Recently, I had a conversation with Mitchell Smith of Pike Consulting when I was on the road at the East Coast Builders Conference in Atlanta. Let's take a look at what he had to say.
Now that's something to keep in mind. If you have some safety screw-ups and would like to share them with us, send them to info at constructtech.tv. Together, we can help make the construction job site just a little bit safer. That's on the road. Information and communication costs are increasing. At the same time, capabilities are increasing. This means more building and automation energy management features. Technovio says integration of the Internet of Things in building automation will grow about 11% through 2021. Today, building service providers directly impact a building's operations. They provide a range of monitoring, diagnostic, control, and even analytical services for equipment and building operations. If you think about it, building owners can expect more from vendors of systems. Retail energy markets are actually slowly emerging. Third-party service providers are even offering wholesale market transactive energy services for buildings. Building on this in the future, I believe equipment and systems will kind of coordinate and communicate with each other. The systems will meet the owner's and the occupant's needs. The structures will also regularly transact with each other's buildings and service providers. Have you ever considered how interoperability approaches for building to grid will pave the way for transactive energy systems? If not, you really should, because the U.S. Department of Energy's Building Technologies Office even has a stake in all of this. It is exploring how building-to-grid integration can improve optimizations of homes and buildings. It is also investing in the DOE's Voltron. This open-source control and coordination platform is a common method of distributed control. It allows the developers to build secure applications. This is changing the game for completely for all of us in the construction industry. Building owners will actually expect more from vendors of the systems in the future. They will seek platforms that are secure and able to communicate real-time data from one system all the way to the next. Owners should request that building automation systems be open and even adaptable to these grid signals. Perhaps this is where it needs to start, with the building owners. They can help drive all this change we talk about all the time. The grid is already changing. There are opportunities for owners to actually participate right now. Will you help move interoperability forward? That's your Innovation in Technology for today. We are currently living in the dawn of the smart city. Sooner than we can imagine, data will be flowing from our devices to our homes, to our streets, to our buildings, and so much more. But with major changes to our infrastructure must come a new way of building for contractors changing on all these ambitious projects. Here to tell us all about it is Carlo Ratti, director of MIT Sensibility City Lab and founder of the Carlo Ratti Association. Carlo, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So Carlo, when you and I have talked in the past, you always like to talk about things as being a sensible city. Let's talk about what that means to you. Well, um, you know, today's a very interesting time in cities. Um, all of those technologies that changed our lives over the past uh, 10, 20 years. Now, now entering physical space. It's about the internet becoming internet of things. And as such, it's transforming so many dimensions of, uh, of urban life. And that's about mobility, it's about uh, waste, water, energy, public participation. So all of these components of urban life are being transformed by internet of things. So in describing that, how will our cities look, let's say in the next 10, 20, maybe even 50 years from now? 
Now, um, first of all, sorry to disappoint you. No, I don't think the cities will look terribly different than what they look today. Um, you know, in the same in the same way as uh, the city in Roman times, so in Middle Ages, uh, doesn't look that different than how it looks today. You know, we 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 need horizontal floors for living. We need facades to protect us from the outside. We need windows in order to look outside. Um, but what will be very very different is actually the way life will uh, will happen in those spaces. So maybe the physical city will not change that much, but uh, but the, the city in terms of the life of the citizens will be radically different. How do you, what do you mean by that? I mean, you know, anything, think about, you know, already today, the way, you know, we move in a city, how different it is, thanks to systems such as Uber, Lyft, and so on. You know, and all of this is going to change immensely with self-driving cars. It's just one example of how, you know, life in the city is going to be radically redefined by Internet of Things. Will we see things different in the way when you describe Uber? Will it be the way we get around transportation-wise, the way we communicate with our buildings, with, with all of that environmentally is the way you're describing it? Yeah, yeah. The, the application are really manifold. It's about, you know, if you think about mobility, um, you know, with self-driving car, it becomes interesting because the car can give you a lift in the morning when you go to your office. They can give a lift to somebody else in your family or to anybody else in the city. So you're creating a new mobility system in between public and private transportation. And, um, and you know, if you take a city such as New York or Paris or Milan or Singapore, a bigger city or a smaller city, theoretically, with that type of system, you could run the city, take everybody to destination when they need to be there with just a fraction of the vehicles we, we have today. So just one example out of many of how, you know, these new technologies, in particular, Internet of Things, and artificial intelligence can have a huge impact on our urban life. Will we be rebuilding our cities in a different way, or will we be using vast amount of data to help us give this new city that you describe? Well, as I was saying, you know, the, the key impact will start most likely with uh, the way we move in the city, the way we deal with many aspects of the city. So it's more about you know the way of living the city than the physical city itself. But then, you know, when you look at uh, this in the longer term, then uh, we will probably need some changes to the infrastructure itself. Um, and if you think about the city of the 20th century, there's no doubt that the city of the 20th century was really shaped by the automobile. And in a similar way, the city of the 21st century will be shaped by the new mobility systems that are, are starting today. And let me give you just one example. You know, today in the United States, a car is used 4 or 5 percent of the time. 95, 96 percent of the time is actually not only it's not used, but it uses valuable space in our cities. Uh, it's parked somewhere. And, uh, you know, if you change just a little bit those percentages, thanks to self-driving car, that means that theoretically we can reclaim so much space in our cities, so much parking space. As a matter of fact, at the moment we are involved in a design of a tower in Singapore, a very tall building, uh, and we're thinking about the parking space from the beginning as something that could be transformed tomorrow. So we're doing the distance between floors a bit higher than usual. Uh, we're putting the ramps outside the parking space. So tomorrow, those spaces, if we need less parking in the city, could be reused for other activities. So that's just one small example of how, you know, of how, for instance, parking might change significantly when, uh, when you look at the city, which is run by driverless vehicles. Will we have a lot of connected vehicles that you described because of this? You t described Uber and other things. Will we have a lot of other connected city services as a result of this? Um, I think, you know, all of this is really the result of Internet of Things and distributed artificial intelligence. You know, the, the, the impact is going to be many folds. But mobility, yes, we'll have many vehicles. I think also we'll get many different form factors. As a matter of fact, in the next issue of Scientific American, we have an article where we talk about this, about really how so the form factor of vehicles could change because of these technologies. Um, but the same thing, you know, that you, when you look at mobility, the same things, the same changes can also happen in many other dimensions. Uh, again, you know, energy, waste, the water, um, you know, citizen participation. Uh, if you think about industry, it's, uh, you know, Internet of Things is bringing uh, this new world is opening up this new world of Industry 4.0. So all of these dimensions of our cities are going to be affected. Carlo, thank you for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Have all a right, great well, day. You too. Well, that's our Learn It for today.
big data. That's our word, or should I say words, of the day. The phrase is relatively new, but the concept has been around for decades. Journey back with me for a moment to 1965. At that moment, the U.S. government planned the first data center to store tax returns and fingerprints. Can you believe that was only 52 years ago? I can't. We have been dealing with all this data for years, but the term big data is really emerged on the scene in the 1990s. It basically refers to storing large amounts of the information, both structured and unstructured. Here at Specialty Media, we've been writing about this for more than 20 years. We have watched all the birth of Web 2.0 has increased with data volume significantly, and we have seen the struggles that the construction industry faces when dealing with big data. Today, we see three big ways that big data is changing the industry. First, it is changing the decision-making and program-solving processes. Data helps with planning forecasts and project progress monitoring. Big data actually facilitates decision-making on a consistent basis. And now that's the good news. The challenge is actually analyzing and storing all this data. That leads me to the second way big data is changing the construction industry. It is requiring CIOs to determine how to access all this information. Perhaps even more importantly, which data should be leveraged and by whom? Those are the really tough questions you have to answer. That is what CIOs, and in some circles, data scientists are actually grappling, grappling with today. The final way big data is changing the industry is how buildings, bridges, and roads operate. Sensors can monitor structures. This big data can then be used to determine which maintenance needs to be scheduled. Data is getting bigger. How are you going to manage it? Big data. That's your word of the day. And thanks for watching Construct Tech TV, where we are all talking tech at the job site.